Okay. Well, thank you very much, Rachel. It's great to be here and I'm coming to you from snowy Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And tonight, as Rachel said, we're going to talk about three of my favorite topics, England, gardening and literature. Now, speaking of gardening, I see there's a stink bug on the top of my computer. So if I have to stop in the middle and take him away, forgive me. But um, I think that one reason that I got interested in these three particular topics is um, when I was 10 years old, I got uh, a copy of The Secret Garden by Francis Hodgson Burnett. And uh, I love uh, that book and that story, especially I think kids love the idea of a secret or a secret garden, especially. But also, um, I love the idea of the garden, which is that um, it, if you haven't read it, it tells you about the healing power of a garden for this little girl and her family. And so it's really a good story. And I think it started my love affair with gardens and with England. So when I started going to England back in 1997, I made a special point of visiting literary gardens, uh, homes of the, my favorite authors. And that's what led me to write the book that Rachel mentioned to you earlier. And also um, it led me to apply for a grant from the Jane Austen Society. And uh, that helped me uh, visit the various uh, gardens and homes that I talk about in that book. And so when I won that grant from the Jane Austen Society, I was required to go to England for two months and, um, and work three days a week at Jane Austen's house, which is the house she lived in for the last um, 11, nine years of her life from 1809 to 1817. And so the, um, the time that I spent working there was because I was a gardener, they decided that they would have me help the gardener in the garden there. So that's the picture that you're seeing here first. And that's what we're going to start with is Jane Austen's garden. So what we're going to do, but first, oh, I'm going to show you a, uh, uh, a couple pictures from the secret garden that did inspire the story that Frances Hodgson Burnett wrote. And in that story, she, the little girl finds a secret door that goes through into this, into this garden. And Frances Hodgson Burnett was working on, or, or um, excuse me, living on this estate where she found this garden. And here it is when you go through the doorway, here's what you'll see today. And it's just a beautiful, stunning garden really, uh, much bigger than I pictured in the book actually. In fact, what you're seeing here is only about half of the full size of the garden. But this is the garden that Frances Hodgson Burnett found when she was living in this house in the early 1900s, and it inspired her to write that story. So uh, when I was writing my book, I had the wonderful opportunity to go and visit that garden and just sit there and imagine what it must have been like for Frances Hodgson Burnett to work in this garden and, um, and enjoy it and be inspired to write her story. Now, getting back to Jane Austen's house, uh, my first day working there, I uh, arrived, as you see here, at Jane Austen's house um, entrance. And um, here's a picture of Jane drawn by her sister, Cassandra. And this picture is in the National Portrait Gallery in London. And so this is really the only authentic picture that we know uh, was, was done of Jane. Um, other, there are a couple others that they think are Jane, but this is the only one that is definitely for sure Jane Austen. So the reason that preserving this house is so important is because, as you can see by this little table, um, this is actually where Jane Austen was living when she uh, first published her books. She had been writing Pride and Prejudice 
and sense and sensibility before she moved into this house. But it wasn't until she moved here that she actually got published. And this is the table that Jane is known to have actually written on. And as you can see, it always makes people gasp because it's so small. Uh, when we think about the large desk we need to do our writing and computers and everything, and all she needed was this little table and a quill pen. So that's why it's really important to preserve these old houses that have that literary connection to our favorite authors. Now, when I first arrived the first day uh, to work at Jane Austen's house, I met Celia, who you see here on the ladder, and she's the head gardener there. And she is pruning some climbing roses. And Celia took me around the garden and it took probably a good two hours to go around the garden, even though it's maybe only half an acre in size. But as we went around, she would say to me, do you know what this garden, uh, this plant is? Do you know what this plant is? And I started to sweat because um, I could see I was really being tested. But I understood because as she explained, she'd have volunteers helping before. And sometimes they would pull up plants that they thought were weeds, but they weren't. And so she wanted to make sure I knew what I was doing. And every now and then I would uh, come across something I didn't know. And, and when she would tell me what it was, I would say, oh, we can't grow that in Pittsburgh. It's not hardy there. So that was sort of kind of my out for not knowing something. But um, Celia was kind enough to teach me a lot about how English people approach gardening. And that's some of what I'm going to share with you tonight. Celia, before she came to Jane Austen's house, worked at the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew. And so she really knows what she's doing. Um, as of now, she's been there a little over 20 years, I believe. So here's the um, side view of Jane Austen's house. Um, even though at the time it was called a, called a cottage, um, and we might think of a cottage as being fairly small, um, this actually has five bedrooms and two outbuildings and um, a fair amount of plants outside. So um, it's actually quite a, a good sized house. When she and her mother and sister came to live there after Jane's father died, um, this was actually part of a much larger estate that was owned by Jane's brother. Now, he had inherited the estate from an uncle who had actually formally adopted him because the uncle had no children. And in order to leave the estate to someone, he had, it had to be an actual relative. So he had adopted Jane's brother who then inherited this estate, which was a couple thousand acres at the time. Um, and then when their father died, he offered this cottage on the estate for Jane and her sister and mother to live on. So um, this is a, a little further view of that first picture you saw. Um, this is actually mostly annuals in the garden. Um, someone asked me at the last time that I did this talk um, if that was a very, if it was very built up higher in the background, but it's not, it's actually quite flat. So she uses a lot of very tall plants um, in the back to add that um, textured sort of look and, uh, and layers it with shorter plants in the front. Um, this actually was a rose garden years ago, but the roses weren't doing well anymore. So she took them all out and put in this perennial and annual garden. And this is the front of the house where again, we have what looks a lot like a very typical English cottage garden and uh, lots of perennials, annuals, maybe a few shrubs thrown in and um, just beautifully maintained and kept. Uh, at the time when I worked there, which was about 15 years ago, Celia uh, had only one volunteer helping her and she was only able to work one day a week. And now they are able to pay her to work two days a week and she has three volunteers. So it's really nice that she has that extra help to keep um, good maintenance in this garden. Now in Jane's time, you would have had what are called shrubberies and a gravel path. 
so that the ladies of the house could walk around the garden and be somewhat protected and sheltered. And um, so it is known that um, the shrubs around the garden are, well, the shrubs that are there now were only put in in the 1950s, but there would have been shrubs there. Uh, there's records from the time when Jane lived there in the early 1800s that um, her brother had shrubs and this gravel path put in. And so she and her sister would have walked around the garden to get fresh air and to get some exercise. So Celia, the gardener there now, um, has sort of recreated that idea with this path with the hedge on the right side and perennials and, and shrubs on the left. So it's a nice um, kind of secret feeling to walking through that area. Now these two large trees are not maybe the most attractive trees, uh, but they're very historic. They are yew trees and they were actually there before this house was built. And so they have been aged, um, dated at being about 400 years old. They're the only uh, plants that we know of that actually would have therefore been on the property when Jane lived there. So therefore they're very protected. Now this tree is an oak tree and the story goes that Jane and her sister planted an oak tree uh, outside that hedge um, when they were living in the cottage. And then um, back in the 1980s, I think it was, the um, oak tree was not doing well and had to be cut down. But nearby, there were little seedlings growing. So they took one of those seedlings, planted it in it inside the hedge. And so they think that this tree came from a, an oak tree that Jane herself would have planted. So that's why it's sort of protected uh, by that bench there. And you can see there's a little plaque on the tree too that tells you that. Now in Jane's time, gardens would not have been used so much for beauty, but more for practical purposes. So we would have had vegetable gardens and herb gardens uh, growing. And that's why Celia has planted this herb garden outside the, what was used as sort of an outside kitchen and laundry area. And so she has these herbs there to represent what kind of plants would have been planted in Jane's time. On the left side, you can see a taller plant going up to the roof. That's actually a fig tree. And another reason for plants during Jane's time would have been to grow plants to provide dye for dyeing fabrics. And there is a letter that Jane wrote to her sister where she talks about uh, dyeing fabric. And so this little garden demonstrates the different kinds of plants that would have been used to dye plants during Jane's time. In the front there you have marigolds and on the left front would be coreopsis and um, in the back is milkweed. And so all of these plants would have been used for dyeing. Now <laughs> here's something you might think looks a little funny. And it kind of is. And so this is a dandelion. Now you might wonder, Carol, why are you showing us a picture of a dandelion? Well, when I worked at Jane Austen's house, I was not allowed to pull out the dandelions. And here's why. They would have been used during Jane's time. For medicinal purposes, you can dry the roots and uh, shred them and use them as a gargle for a sore throat. You could also, of course, make dandelion wine or dandelion jelly, or you might have even used the greens in a salad. So things like that are, you, are kept in the garden. But it was really difficult for me to uh, stop myself from digging out the dandelions because it's just such a natural thing to do in my own gardening work. And so sometimes I would find a dandelion sort of mingled in with other plants and I would say, oh, Celia, this has to go or it's going to choke out the other plant. And she'd say, all right, you can dig it out. Now, since then, I have visited uh, the house many times. And she did admit to her, me that she has stopped allowing the dandelions 
to spread because they were getting to be too many. So I just sort of tease her and say, well, at least the American taught you one thing. So one thing that uh, Celia does is uh, use natural insect repellent methods. And this one actually goes back to Elizabethan times. That's a potato that has uh, natural bird feathers that are found in the garden stuck into it. And I guess the idea is that when the uh, birds see the, the feathers, they feel like there might be a predator there. And so they stay away from the vegetable garden. Of course, the potato gets kind of yucky, so you have to change that every so often if you want to try that idea. Now, surrounding the two sides of the garden today um, is this huge hedge. I guess it's maybe about 20 feet tall or so. And this is actually a beech tree hedge. And it goes along two sides of the garden. I would guess it's probably about 100 feet long on each side. And it's made completely of beech trees that are sheared to make this dense hedge. Now, in England, they have nursery gardens um, or hedge, hedge nurseries, excuse me. And the hedge nurseries grow uh, trees specifically to create hedges. So you plant them closer together than you would a, a natural, an actual normal beech tree. And you would shear it so that it would uh, create this nice dense hedge. So that goes around two sides of the garden. As I mentioned earlier, this was planted in the 1950s. What I like about it too is that from a distance, you can see that little dome sort of feature at the top, which kind of draws your attention to the fact that there is something extra there. And the something extra is a doorway that goes through to the gardener's area. And generally the public doesn't go through here, but I'm going to show you what you'll find when you go through that. One thing is a cutting garden. The cutting garden is out of sight of the rest of the garden because you don't wanna be cutting all the flowers off in your garden and then ruining the look of the garden. So you have it separate out of the, out of the way so that you can cut flowers and take them in to your house or in this case, they take them in and put them uh, around the house inside. So um, the other thing in the gardener's area is a wonderful compost system. And here we have three compost areas uh, and one is for each year. So two years ago is the one that you're going to use the compost in your gardening this year. Last year's is still composting. And then this year's you're adding new fresh stuff from the garden. And if you wanna build a compost bin for yourself, you don't want to put anything in there that has gone to seed because the seeds might not die and you don't want to then add the compost to your garden with weed seeds in it. Um, also, Celia does not put anything woody in there. She has a separate pal for woody materials. And then the woody materials are, are um, burned once or twice a year. And they then the ashes from that go around the roses in the garden. So everything gets used and reused. Uh, the, the compost system in the front, you can see there maybe, if you look closely, these slats that are in the front are in a sort of channel. So each slat can pull out so it can make it easy for you to then access the compost. And then in between each slat is a little uh, piece of terracotta from broken flower pots. And this helps to give you a little bit of air circulation in your compost or compost as they say in England. Now, um, this is really a great system. And um, I, uh, the one thing that people get worried about with compost is turning the compost pile. But in this case, I'll tell you that Celia never does that. She just keeps piling it in and um, just lets it decompose on its own. It does take a long time though, because like I said, the one is from two years ago. So it takes a while to get it to be usable in the garden. 
One thing that I found in visiting gardens in England is that gardeners tend to be rather whimsical. And um, this is a good example of that. When Celia uh, was working in the garden, she decided to tuck these ferns up under this little roof in the back of the house. Um, they were, the, the plants she put back there originally were much smaller than you see now. So she just tucked them under the tiles and they um, grew beautifully. But one day after she first did that, she found the fern laying on the ground and she thinks someone actually was going, plucked it off the, off the roof and was going to take it with them. But either maybe someone saw them or maybe they just changed their mind because then they dropped it on the ground. So she tucked it back up higher. Unfortunately, they've recently had some um, inspections of the roof and the inspectors decided you really can't have plants growing on the roof because it might really damage the roof and, and underneath those tiles. So she had to take those ferns away. Now I mentioned that Jane's brother uh, had inherited a large estate and this was his house. So Jane, her sister and her mom lived in the little cottage. Uh, the, her brother lived in this 50 room um, manor house. Um, it was a beautiful manor house. Um, but as it got passed down from her brother, brother to his children and grandchildren and great grandchildren, over the years, of course, they did not have money to keep it up. And some of the estate had to go up for sale. And um, different portions were sold off over the years. And the portion that is now Jane Austen's cottage um, or the Jane Austen House Museum um, was bought by a, an organization called the Jane Austen Memorial Trust back in the 1950s. And they uh, preserved the house as it is. But this house, her brother's house, um, had deteriorated so badly and the owners could not maintain it and did not have money to do the repairs. So they put it up for sale. Well, there was a Jane Austen Society meeting in North America and they said, uh, one of the speakers said, hey, you know, Jane Austen's brother's house is for sale. If anyone has a few million dollars to invest, why don't you um, come on over and help us out? As it turned out, there was someone in the audience that day who was a, an avid collector of British literature. And her name was Sandy Lerner. And she had started a company called Cisco Systems with her husband. And over the years, she had accumulated a library of, I think, over 5,000 volumes and she'd been wondering what she could do with this. She'd been thinking of maybe donating it to a university, but she was in the audience that day because she was a Jane Austen lover. And she decided this would be a perfect place to put my library. So th they created a, a trust for the, for the building and renovated it and turned it into a library for women's literature from the 1600s to the 1860s, I think it is. Um, the venue is now available for uh, private parties and weddings and so forth, as well as for scholarly research. So it's a great place to visit. And for a while, they also had what on the left you'll see here with that little conservatory um, were actually the horse stables, which had been renovated. And then they were renting it out as a B&B. &B. Um, and you could, this is inside that little conservatory, you could eat your breakfast there. Unfortunately, um, when the pandemic hit, they decided they had to close. And um, I do believe it's now privately rented, so you can't um, do it as a B&B &B anymore. But it is still available to visit the main house and the gardens there. So now that we've been thoroughly immersed in Jane Austen's world, we're going to take a, another um, journey up to uh, the Lake District of England, which is Northern England. And we're going to visit Beatrix Potter's house. And some of you may have seen the movie um, with um, 
um, oh darn, I can't think of her name now, um, Renee Zellweger playing uh, a young Beatrix Potter. It's really a good movie if you haven't seen it. And so um, this is, this is uh, Beatrix Potter in front of her house. Now, when she grew up, she actually grew up in London, but she and her family visited the Lake District in the summers for their holiday. And she loved the Lake District. Um, the fresh air and the wildlife and the beauty of the lakes and the mountains. And so when she started uh, making some money from her writing, she bought this property there. And over the years, she kept adding on to the property. So eventually she had over 4,000 acres and she was one of the first people to donate their estate to the National Trust. And so it is open to the public now. And the really interesting thing about visiting Beatrix Potter's house is how she used where she lived in her work. Of course, most of us are familiar with the little books that have the um, uh, Peter Rabbit and so forth. And so here you can see that, that doorway that she was standing in a minute ago. And on the right, you can see the picture from the book, The Tale of Tom Kitten. And um, so you can see how it really matches completely the doorway of that house. And she even has the climbing vines and roses and so forth um, going up around the doorway, just as you can see it today. So she really used where she lived as an important part of her writing and her drawing. And that actually was one of the main themes of my book is how these different writers used where they lived as part of their work. Here you can also see in A Tale of Tom Kitten, um, on the right, you can see the picture from the book where the, the kittens are going up towards that doorway. And today you can see that path that goes up to the doorway as well. And here you see um, an idea from, um, this is actually um, the duckling story, but um, the, the fence and the vegetable garden inside are very much from the tale of Peter Rabbit. Um, you can remember that in Peter Rabbit, his mother told him, don't go into Mr. McGregor's garden. So they do have the gate there so that you can't go into the garden. Also, it's very small and they don't really want a lot of visitors um, trampling around in there. But you can see here from the brick wall and the, and the little gate, um, or I'm sorry, it's more of a stone wall, um, that she really used exactly where she lived in her work. And this is a view from um, her study in the house. And um, you can see again, the picture on the right is from the tale of Samuel Whiskers. And on the left is the view from her study. So um, it's just a beautiful property. And the other fun thing that they have at this house when you visit is you'll see these little books open throughout the house uh, showing you exactly what you're seeing. You're not supposed to take pictures inside the house, so I don't have any from there to show you. But I can tell you that, for example, going up the stairway, there's a grandfather clock, and they have a picture in uh, open next to the grandfather clock showing you that same picture in the book, which I think is also from the tale of Samuel Whiskers. So really a charming, wonderful place to visit. Um, the other thing that was really interesting about Beatrix Potter is that she was one of the very first authors who was very savvy about merchandising her work. And so she copyrighted her work and, and approved things like uh, bowls, cereal bowls and mugs and so forth uh, that featured Peter Rabbit, for example. And if you see those today, you'll still see that, that same copyright is on those. So you can't use Peter Rabbit or any of her um, pictures or her animals or drawings um, yourself. They're all copyrighted. And so she was very savvy in the early 1900s to do that and to protect her work. The other thing about Beatrice Potter is that she was very, very gracious to people visiting her. 
she was very well known in America and people from America who would visit her at this home, she lived there from 1905 to 1943. So people, when they would visit her, um, she found there were a lot of American visitors and she would always stop and take the time to talk to them and show them around the property. So she was very gracious and, um, and very intelligent. Um, she also, as she became, uh, as she aged, she started to get more interested in uh, farming and especially the Herdwick sheep. And she, she had um, protected this sheep uh, because they were sort of a dying breed of sheep. And so um, she is well known for having um, protected them and um, had those particular kind of sheep on her property and was I think head of a, um, an agricultural group that also protected them. So now we're going to go from Beatrix Potter a little further uh, northeast to the Bronte Parsonage. And this is where the, the three famous Bronte sisters lived from 1820 to 1855. Their father was a parson. And so they got to live in this house. Um, when they moved here from Ireland, uh, their mother died not long afterwards. And they had um, an aunt came to live with them. And they were kind of um, um, loners, I guess you would say, the, the children. They kind of stuck among themselves. And here we see a picture of the three main sisters uh, there were two others who died younger, but um, this is Charlotte, Emily, and um, Anne. And the reason this picture looks so uh, beat up and creased is because it's a painting that actually had been all folded up and it was later found in an attic. And now you will we'll see it in the National Portrait Gallery. But it was drawn by their brother, uh, Branwell, and he actually was in this picture originally. And if you look in the middle where it's sort of yellow looking, you can actually see a faint outline of a man with a, a, a coat on, you can sort of see the collar of his coat. And he uh, painted himself out. Apparently, uh, I mean, it's just conjecture on our part, of course, but perhaps he just decided he didn't like himself in the picture or for whatever reason, he painted himself out. So next to the parsonage is the cemetery. So kind of a gloomy location to be living. And the other aspect of the cemetery is that the parsonage and the cemetery are up on the top of a hill. And of course, um, sewage systems were not really in great um, condition at that time. And so a lot of the sewage just ran right down the hill. And so their parents or their father had said, you know, don't go down to the town. It's, you'll get sick if you go down there. It's not very healthy down there. So go up on the, um, on the moors instead. So they would go outside. Now this is actually right outside, outside the parsonage. And it is thought that um, they would take their writing tables outside and um, do their, some of their writing outside there. But instead of going down to the town of Haworth, which you can see here, and of course, today, the town really um, celebrates the Bronte sisters and their work you'll see lots of different shops named after them and lots of little souvenirs for sale. But instead of going down into that town, they would go up to the moors. And so this is what you would see. And there are several paths through the moors. You can get a map when you're visiting there and you can walk up on the moors. And so to me, I think um, instead of a, a garden that is cultivated, um, to the Brontes, this was more their garden, was to go up into the moors and walk around the heath and the heather and the rocks. And you can just sort of hear 
um, Kathy and Heath, Heathcliff calling to each other. Um, well, that might be a little fanciful. But um, one thing that they found is that um, it, the, the Moors were so closely associated with the Brontes that they had an art contest. And the premise of the contest was to come up with something that would uh, represent the literary landscape. And this is what they came up with. Um, this artist came up with, these are actually just concrete books um, that are buried, half buried into the ground. So when you're walking along the path there, you kind of come into these books that are growing out of the ground. And I think that's very clever that they would have something like that. Um, it's very simple, but it does represent the literary landscape. So uh, next we're going to one of my favorite mystery writers, Agatha Christie. And this is a picture of Agatha, which again is in the National Portrait Gallery now and in London, so you can go and see um, all of these people there. Um, but this was Agatha's house in Devon, which would be southwest um, England. So it's pretty much right on a river, the River Dart. And um, this was her house. And when you turn around from there, you look down and you see the river. And so this was her favorite place. She didn't actually do a lot of her writing here, but this was more her hideaway. She had several other houses and apartments, um, one in London and another one um, sort of near Oxford, I think it is. And so you can go and visit some of these other places where she lived, but none of them are open to the public except for this one, which is Greenway. What's kind of fun, I think, throughout the estate is that they have these little doorways. So to me, it sort of goes along with Agatha Christie being a mystery writer. And so um, you're walking through the doorway and it's a little bit of a mystery. What will you find when you go through the doorway? And um, they have a lot, because it's on the Devon coast, it gets the Gulf Stream winds. So it's actually pretty warm. So you'll find a lot of camellias and rhododendrons and so forth. Um, things that you frequently would find a little south of Pittsburgh, more like in um, uh, maybe mid Southern Virginia. But when you go through this doorway and down that path, you keep going down the, this path in the woods and you come to this boathouse. Now the boathouse features in one of Agatha's books called Dead Man's Folly and the victim is found dead in the boathouse. Now, it is thought that Agatha sometimes came down and did a little writing here, but more it was, it was for a place for people to come and have parties and, um, and relax. The really interesting thing about this boathouse, and you can take a boat up the river, which is how I got this picture. Um, the really interesting thing about this is that this river, the Dart River, is a salt river. So um, it comes up from the sea. So it's salt water coming up whenever the tide is in. And when you uh, look at those three openings at the base of the building, the water actually goes into what you might consider to be sort of the basement of the building and creates kind of a swimming pool. So you can actually have a seawater swimming pool of your own at the bottom of this building. So pretty cool. Now, further down the river is um, the, the uh, fairy cottage. And the fairy cottage uh, is featured in another of her books called Ordeal by Innocence. And again, you can take a uh, river cruise, which you can see from the sign here um to this um, cottage and um that's where um when in ordeal by innocence hercule perot arrives and you ring the bell for the ferryman and he will ferry you across the river 
So the man who runs the ferry lives in this cottage. Now you can see it's a thatched roof cottage, which is um, so picturesque and so typical of English uh, architecture. But when I was working at Jane Austen's house and also at the Chotton House Library that I talked about, um, I was fortunate enough to meet a great, 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 great nephew of Jane Austen's, Richard Knight. And he was asking me how I was enjoying England. And I said, oh, you know, the, the thatched roof cottages are so charming. And he said, oh, yes, but you don't want to live in a thatched roof cottage, he advised me. You want to live across the street from a thatched roof cottage because then you can look out the window and say, oh, isn't it charming? But you don't have to pay to repair it and replace it every 20 years. And you don't have the problem of um, fire hazards. And there's also a little problem sometimes if you've been to England, you might notice the thatched roofs have a sort of mesh, a metal mesh over them. And that's to try to keep out um, birds and other animals from nesting in them. So in case you're thinking of moving to England, keep that in mind, move across the street from an, a thatched cottage, don't buy one. Now, this is uh, another part of Agatha's estate. And this is a putting green, which actually was used in the book, Dead Man's Folly. And also uh, Agatha's grandson remembers having parties and games on this specific lawn. And in the book and in the grandson's memory, um, they played a game called clock golf. And if you haven't heard of that, I had to look it up. Um, what you do is you put one hole in the middle and then you put fixed points in 12 spots around that hole, so sort of like a clock. And then you have to hit your golf ball into the hole from each spot around the clock. So from one o'clock, two o'clock and so on. And of course, whoever gets the most golf balls into the hole wins. So Agatha's grandson remembers playing this, but they also set this up as a game in Dead Man's Folly. Now in the background, you see this wonderful hedge of dahlias. And those dahlias are about, most of them, three, four, even five feet tall. And I did have a, a tour with the gardener there. And he told me that it was Agatha Christie herself who planted these back, I think, in the 1960s. And they hadn't been lifted since then. Now, I don't know what the weather's like in Connecticut, but here in Pittsburgh, we can't leave dahlias in the ground all winter. You have to lift them and save them for next year. Or if you're not very thrifty, just buy new ones next year. But these have been there because of that mild Gulf Stream. These have been there um, since then. Now, it was quite a few years ago that I took that tour with the gardener. He did say that they were probably going to have to lift them soon and divide them because they was getting pretty crowded. So I imagine that's probably been done by this point. But he did say that you can use uh, coffee grounds around the dahlias. They like the acidity of the coffee grounds. So if you need something to help make your dahlias look big and healthy like these are, um, there's a tip for you. Um, a, a gardener in another property told me the same thing about roses, that they put coffee grounds around their roses. So generally, um, coffee grounds make the soil a little more acidic. So anytime you want something with a little more acid in your soil, that's something that you can do. Now, so that brings us back to our final garden to visit, which is Great Maytham Hall, which is the garden of Frances Hodgson Burnett. Now, when Frances was a young girl, she was born in England, but after her father died, her family had to move to America. Her mother and she and her brother and sister all moved to, I think it was Tennessee, because um, her mother had a brother who lived there. And he said, come on, come on over and I'll help you and we'll help each other. And um, so that's what they did. So Francis was uh, fairly young when they moved there. 
Um, it was just after the Civil War and it was kind of um, hard to um, make a living. So they really struggled. But Frances had always wanted to write. And so she really didn't have money to even buy pencils or paper. She had heard that you could send stories to magazines and sell them, but she had no paper or pencils to write with. So one of the neighborhood children said, we can go down to the wild grape fields and pick grapes and take them to the market and sell them. So that's what she did. She took grapes, uh, she picked grapes, took them down to the market, sold them, and uh, that's how she was able to buy pencils and paper to write her first story and send it into a magazine and it sold. And she never looked back from that time. In fact, she pretty much supported her family within a couple of years from her writing. She sold a lot of stories to magazines before she started writing novels. And she wrote quite a lot of novels that were mm, kind of romances. And they were, and some sort of historical romances in some cases, and they were very popular. And so she became very successful. Her biggest success, of course, was Little Lord Fauntleroy, which was made into a movie several times and a play um, before she actually ended up writing The Secret Garden. But when she lived in, uh, she moved back to England for a while and lived in this house. And that's when she found this garden. The walls from it were actually built in 1721. And the garden itself, she filled with roses. But unfortunately, uh, during after she left and uh, World War II started, they had to rip out all the roses and plant a victory garden vegetables and fruits so that people had food to eat. And it wasn't until much later, um, more recently really, that um, the house itself became um, a condo. Um, for a while it was apartments and then it was a condo. And um, so you can buy uh, apartments there and that's the house in the background. And um, and the people there uh, have kept up the garden. Now, this is only about half the garden that you're seeing. Down the right side is a pergola, which is a wooden structure that's covered with all kinds of climbing flowers, uh, clematis, roses, grapevines, and so forth. Um, and it's a beautiful, nice shady uh, path to walk down there. As you can see, the lawn is striped, which is generally considered a very um, posh kind of thing to do to your to your lawn in England. Um, and you'll see it here mostly more on golf courses, but we sometimes see it in, in people's gardens too, or in people's lawns. And so um, you can see the striping on there. What they do is they have a sort of um, uh, a roller on the back of the lawnmower and it pushes the blades of grass forward. And then when you come back in the other direction, it pushes them the other way. So you create that stripe. But around those brick walls, uh, wonderful shrubs and perennials are planted all over this garden. So um, we're going to end with this wonderful gardener's cottage where they store their gardening tools. And um, there are some plants here, especially there are some roses in this little spot that are named after the estate in the Secret Garden book. And that estate was called Misselthwaite Manor and the roses here are called the Misselthwaite Rose. And the, and the, um, the, the story of a secret garden, um, if you're not familiar with it, it's a, a young girl comes to a house, um, her parents have died, and um, she finds this garden and she helps her young uh, um, uh, cousin who hasn't been able to walk and he is able to walk finally. And so I thought this was a great garden for us to end with during this time that um, has been so difficult over the past couple of years. And when you think about 
being positive and the healing power of a garden, um, this book really helps you to uh, see that. And so I'd like to finish by reading for you this small passage um, from the end of The Secret Garden. The narrator says, much more surprising things can happen to anyone who, when a disagreeable or discouraged thought comes into his mind, just has the sense to remember in time and put it out by putting in an agreeable, determinedly courageous one. Two things cannot be in one place. Where you tend a rose, my lad, a thistle cannot grow. And I think that's a great way um, to think about life and to think about gardening. And I hope that you'll all uh, kind of keep that in mind as we, as we continue through this pandemic. And I hope that you've enjoyed seeing um, some of these gardens and uh, I've enjoyed sharing them with you.